Okay, so in this presentation, we're going to go over the genetic inheritance pattern known as autosomal dominance. And here we have a man and a woman, and let's keep this family friendly, and let's say this is a husband and wife. And let's say for now the husband has an autosomal dominant disorder, and I'm going to make his genotype this, capital D, lowercase d, heterozygous. And you'll see why I chose that in a little bit. The mother, I'm going to have her healthy, and so her genotype is going to be homozygous recessive, two lowercase d's. Well, this has kind of given us a clue as to the pattern of autosomal dominance. Look at the key. If a genetic disorder is autosomal dominant, that means that the disorder is dominant and having the healthy allele is recessive. And when we look at the possible gene combinations, when when it, when when we look at a Punnett square, you notice there's four parts to a Punnett square. That's because there are four possible allele combinations that a child might inherit. For instance, the child might inherit a capital D from dad and a lowercase d from mom, and this person would be heterozygous. Another possible combination would be a lowercase d from each parent. This would be called homozygous recessive. A third possible combination might be a capital D from the father and a lowercase d from the mother. This would be called heterozygous. And the last possible combination, again, would be two lowercase d's, one from each parent. And these are the four genetic uh, allele combinations right here. These are the four possible genotypes. And in the case of autosomal dominance, you're often going to hear that if one parent has an autosomal dominant disorder, that they're going to have a 50-50 chance of having a child with the disease. So let's go into this in more detail. So first of all, what's an autosome? Well, autosomal dominant is the topic of this presentation. So what's an autosome? First of all, here's a karyotype. And if we look at the definition of an autosome, an autosome by definition is a non-sex chromosome. That would be chromosomes 1 through 22. Chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4. So in this karyotype, I'm numbering the chromosome pairs. We've all inherited two chromosome 15s, and two chromosome 21s, and two chromosome 3s. These are called the autosomes. These are the non-sex chromosomes. If you, if you recall, chromosome 23 could be the XX for a female or an XY for a male. So chromosome 23 are the sex chromosomes. Autosomes are all the others. And so what we're going to look at are autosomal disorders. Autosomal disorders are disorders that are caused by a gene that happens to be located on one of these 22 chromosomes. Now you might be more familiar with autosomal recessive disorders. Uh, these, are the, these are the disorders that kind of follow the rules and patterns that Gregor Mendel discovered when he was experimenting with pea plants. And in these disorders, an individual must inherit two copies of the allele, one copy of the allele from the father, one from the mother, in order to be affected. So I have that little key in the lower left-hand corner. Autosomal recessive is when healthy is dominant and the disorder is recessive. And so here we have a, an outline of a male and female and their child. Well, if the child inherits one dominant allele from, father, from the father and one dominant allele from the mother, the child's going to be healthy if the disorder is autosomal recessive. Of course, there's another possible combination. Perhaps the father will pass on a dominant allele. Perhaps the mother will pass on a recessive allele. But if the disorder is recessive, the child's going to be healthy because of that capital H making the child healthy. And so with an autosomal recessive disorder, the only way to have the disorder is to inherit one recessive allele from the father and a second recessive allele from the mother. Now the child would have the disorder if the disorder was autosomal recessive. So in autosomal recessive, which you might be more familiar with, healthy is dominant. I like to use H's 
when I do my Punnett squares. That's kind of the style and format that I use. You don't have to use H, but whatever letters you're going to use, they have to be capitalized if we're talking healthy autosomal recessive. Healthy is dominant. And that means that the, dece the disease, whatever the disease is, is recessive. Examples of recessive autosomal recessive diseases. Cystic fibrosis is an example of an autosomal recessive disorder here. And this is a disorder you may have heard of where it affects the lungs probably most severely. It causes a buildup of mucus and ultimately uh, greatly shortens the lifespan, the life expectancy of the sufferers. And the reason this is called an autosomal recessive disorder, again, the gene that causes cystic fibrosis is on chromosome 7. Albinism, you may have heard, albinism is where a person lacks those uh, certain skin pigments, and so they often have a very white, pale appearance to their skin. Sometimes they have visual defects, they're more sensitive to sunlight. Well, this is also an autosomal disorder because the gene that causes albinism is on chromosome number 11. So you have to inherit one chromosome number 11 with a defected gene from, from the mother and another chromosome 11 with a defected gene from the father. And the last one to mention is a disorder, PKU, phenylketonuria. It's a buildup of an amino acid, and ultimately it can cause seizures and intellectual defects. But this gene that causes PKU is found on chromosome 12. In order to have the disease PKU, because it's autosomal recessive, you have to inherit two copies of the allele, one from the chromosome 12 from your mother, one from the chromosome 12 from your father. Well, uh, the, what, what this karyotype shows, again, chromosome 23 is not an autosome. Chromosome 23 are the sex chromosomes. So if there are diseases on the X or the Y chromosome, we call them sex-linked. One that you might have heard of is a bleeding disorder called hemophilia. Hemophilia is where a person can have a very a minor injury, but they could have severe bleeding. And so this is an example of a sex-linked disorder. But we're going to stick with autosomes. I just wanted to bring up the difference really quick. So now let's move on to autosomal dominance. After all, that is the topic of this, of this video. With autosomal dominant, it's a little different. In order to suffer from an autosomal dominant disease, you only need to inherit one copy of the disorder, one copy of the allele. And so when you look, the, it's been flipped. The disease is dominant, where any kind of capital H will give you the disease, whether you're homozygous dominant or heterozygous, and therefore healthy is recessive. So if I put that key back in the lower left-hand corner, you can see that the, the rules, the pattern of autosomal dominance have flipped. And so if we put our, our man, woman, and child back, if a child inherits one capital H from the father, one capital H from the mother, this used to be a healthy child. If the disease is autosomal recessive, the child will be healthy. But what we're looking at now are autosomal dominant disorders. And because the, uh, the disease is dominant, this individual would have the disorder. Another combination might be if the child inherits a capital H from the father and a lowercase h from the mother, the child is still going to have a disorder. Even though they have a lowercase h healthy, even though they have one healthy allele, they still have one uh, of the alleles for the disorder. And that's going to give the child the, the, the disease because the disease is dominant. And so the only way to have a healthy individual, if you have a history of autosomal dominance in the family, is to inherit not just one lowercase h healthy allele from the father, but a second lowercase h healthy allele from the mother. That's the only combination that will give a healthy individual. And that's the probably the biggest difference between autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive. Examples of autosomal dominant disorders. Probably one of the more 
uh, famous ones is Huntington's disease. It's a disease caused by a gene located on chromosome number four. And you only have to inherit one chromosome number four with the defected gene. And what it causes is in the late 30s, early 40s, it causes brain cells to die and the, the people start to have these uh, uncontrollable, uncontrollable muscle shakes. And the picture shows the folk singer by the name of Woody Guthrie who sang, this land is your land, this land is my land. And it's probably, he, he's probably the, the more, one of the more famous persons to have had Huntington's disease. Another example of a autosomal dominant disorder is a brain disorder called neurofibromatosis. Uh, the gene that causes this is on chromosome 17. You only have to inherit one chromosome 17 with the defected gene. It causes a uh, muscle to, or excuse me, it causes tumors to form inside the brain. So very serious. And another example of a autosomal dominant disorder is uh, abbreviated as simply FH, familial hypercholesterolemia, and it's a high cholesterol disorder that ultimately can lead to cardiovascular disease. And so these three examples are all characterized by being autosomal dominant. You only need to inherit one copy of the allele to have the disease. Well, let's go over some story problems to see if we can solve these genetic problems now. So let's go over a couple of practice problems. Just to remind ourselves, in autosomal dominant, the disease is dominant. So there's two possible combinations a person could have in order to have the disease. Now, in the story problem, the disease is dominant and healthy is recessive. So one of the, th one of the problems you're going to be faced with is if you're told that a person has a disease, you have to figure out, are they capital H, capital H? homozygous dominant, or are they capital H, lowercase h, heterozygous? And when it comes to autosomal dominant, uh, uh, one of the deciding factors for, for you will be the age of the person who has the disease. Like it says in the notes, homozygous dominant individuals, they don't survive very long. They have such a severe form of the disease that it usually takes their life at a very young age. But if the person's heterozygous, they can live into their adulthood years. So watch this story right here. Paul has the disease called familial hypercholesterolemia, and his wife Stacy is healthy. The two of them have three children, and after testing, the middle child is the only one who's healthy. So Paul has the disease and he's married with three children. That implies right there that Paul is in his adulthood years. The story never tells me whether or not Paul is capital H, capital H, or capital H, lowercase h. The story never tells me. But because Paul is in his adulthood, ye adulthood years, married with three children, he has to be heterozygous. So let me set up a Punnett square. Paul is the square and Stacy is the circle. Squares represent male and circles represent females. And I'm going to make three branches, one branch for each child. I made the children boy, boy, girl. Square, square, circle. You can make the children any gender you wish. The gender of the child is not very relevant in, in determining the genotype and phenotype of everyone here. Well, the story tells me that Paul has the disease, so I'm going to color in his square. And the story tells me that only the middle child is healthy, so I'm going to color in the other two children. Because when you color in a circle and square, that implies they have the disease. I know Paul's genotype has to be heterozygous because he's married, he's got three children, he's clearly lived into his adulthood years. And the story also tells me that Stacy is healthy, so I'm gonna, I now know Stacy's genotype. Well, now that I know Paul and Stacy, I can set up their Punnett square. And when I set up their Punnett square, all I have to do now is fill in the four Punnett squares. And once I've done that, I can fill in the inside of the Punnett square just as a reminder that anything with a capital H in it, the person's going to have the disease called familial hypercholesterolemia. But the two bottoms part, the two bottom squares, 
are healthy individuals. So you can see there is a one-half chance. There's a 50-50 chance that every child will have the disease. You can see that in the Punnett square right now. Well, look at the three children. I know that the child on the left, the square on the left, is colored in. They have to have the disease. The square in the middle is not colored in. The square in the middle has to be healthy. The square on the right is, or, excuse me, the circle. The circle on the right is colored in. That tells me the circle on the right has the disease. So from very little information, I was able to figure out all of this. Let's. So here's a, a, our final practice problem that we're going to do together. Huntington's disease is a dominant disorder found on chromosome 4. Betty and Marcus met at a support clinic that they've been attending to help them cope with the knowledge of their illness with Huntington's disease. So both Betty and Marcus have Huntington's disease. They met one another while they were trying to receive emotional support uh, because they knew that they had Huntington's disease. And now they want to know the risk of having a healthy child now that Betty is pregnant. So I have a square for Marcus and a circle for Betty, and I connected them, and the child is a boy, perhaps. If you want to make the child a girl, go right ahead. Well, I'm going to color in the square and circle of Marcus and Betty because they each have the disease. Now, they have to be heterozygous because clearly they are of adulthood years. They're, they're at the age to marry and have a child. Uh, if they were, if either of them were homozygous dominant, they would not have lived this long into their life. They have to be heterozygous. So now that I know Betty and Marcus are heterozygous, I can fill in the Punnett square. And when we do, we kind of have some sad news in this Punnett square. Look at the Punnett square in the top left-hand corner. That's the severe version of the disease. There's a one in four chance that child could be born with a severe form of the disease. You can see that there's two Punnett squares that have the heterozygous combination. And there's only a one out of four chance that that child will be healthy. So there's some fairly depressing news here. So uh, we can see what uh, we can see that the probability is, is really not on their side in this example here. But this is what we've learned, is we've learned how to calculate and make predictions. And so go ahead and pause the video here, and I hope this was helpful as we go about our understanding of genetics. Pause the video and try to answer some of these questions. If you're in my biology class, bring your answer to me on a separate sheet of paper. I'd be happy to check them for accuracy. Good luck.